How about the Mavericks? I like the announcer, Marv Albert. Every time Dirk would score, he would go, yes! <laughs> what a great voice. Yes! Today we're talking about yes. It's a little word, a word that we use all the time. And I would argue that we're the sum total of the word. We say yes in our minds. We say yes and we articulate sounds and make that three-letter word yes. We, we say it a lot. And then we also say the opposite of yes, don't we? We say no. We say, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I can't show up. When someone's talking, we think to ourselves, no, no, no. Or maybe yes, yes, yes. Over the next several weeks, I'm talking about yes and no. Yes and no. Say yes and stick by it. Say yes and it will serve you well. Say yes and commit to it. Do you say no without giving an excuse? Can you say no in a no holds barred way? Just no. No. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, these words. Turn there if you have a Bible. Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Why did Jesus say it? He was talking to a bunch of Pharisees, and the Pharisees had devised this, this system, the system of swearing. I'm not talking about cussing, but, but they devised this system of swearing by heaven and earth and the city of Jerusalem, and they were swearing by body parts, and, and basically they were trying to sidestep the truth. And Jesus said, hey guys, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He was saying... If you're a true Christ follower, your character should be so noble, your conversation so rich that when you say yes, you mean it, and when you say no, you mean it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If I say the right yes, it will lead to great success. That rhymes. <laughs> Let's say that. If I say the right yes, it will lead to great what? Success. On the other hand, if I say the wrong yes, it will lead to a big honking mess. <laughs> We've all said the wrong yeses before, haven't we? Wow. You say yes. Whenever you talk to someone who's experiencing a problem, maybe they made a dumb financial move or or maybe they're in the relational weeds, or whatever it is. If you ask them, where did the wheels come off? Where did you have the problem? What happened? They don't say, well, I just, I just said the wrong yes, and then I stumbled down the staircase of life. They don't, they don't say that. Usually, it was a lot of little bitty yeses that, that led to this big mess. Those little yeses, a yes, yes. Yes, 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 and ah, then they fall into the abyss of rebellion and problems. I knew a guy years ago, I called him the yes man. Every time I made him laugh, he would laugh like this, yes, 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 yes. I played a game in my mind. I thought, how many times can I get this guy to say yes in one conversation? One time he said yes like over a hundred times. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Say yes, the right yes to God's principles. If I say the right yes to God's principles, then I'm going to meet the right people, and then I can say yes to his purposes. If I say the wrong yes... To the wrong principles, I'm going to meet the wrong people and end up in the wrong places and missing the purposes that God has for me. Yes and no. The right yes or the wrong yes. I say the right yes, I'm going to be a success. The wrong yes, my life will be a colossal mess. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Think about the promises of God. Think about God sending Jesus Christ 
to die on the cross for our sins and rise again. If God didn't go back on that promise, he's not going to go back on any other promise. The verse continues. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. We can say amen to the promises of God. What does amen mean? It means so let it be. I I grew up around preachers. My father is a preacher, and certain preachers say amen a little bit too much. I talk to some preachers, amen. They say amen all the time, amen. I play golf with some preachers, and they'll make a putt. They'll go, amen. I knew one that used amen as a question. Amen. So we can say amen to the promises of God. Let your yes be yes. Let your yes be yes, a word of commitment, a word of decisiveness, a word of affirmation. Our culture, though, we, we know how to give the empty yes, don't we? You know, the if something better comes along, yes, or the decaffeinated yes. We've, we've taken yes and we've spayed it, we've neutered it, we've hollowed it out, and yes doesn't mean yes anymore. In our culture, yes means maybe. Maybe I'll stay with my spouse, but if someone better looking cruises by, maybe I'll stay with him, but if he says this or does that or doesn't do that, I'm out. Maybe. Yes, no, maybe so. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Think about, just for a second, think about the last week. Think about how many times you said yes. Yes to God. Or maybe no to him. How many times did you say yes to the important people in your life? To your mate? To your kids? How about your friends, the people you run with? What did you say yes to with them? Think about the choices, those moral intersections, those opportunities. You say yes? With a net effect of yes and no. It, it is literally staggering to think about how often we say it. Let your yes be yes, Jesus said. What should we say yes to? That, that's a good question. For starters, we should say yes to Jesus. I was thinking about that. He gives us the ability to even say yes to him. We're made in the image of God. God said yes to us. He placed man and woman in a perfect environment. It was was nirvana. I'm not talking about the band. Yet, we said no to God's yes. We sinned. God said yes, we said no. Before we said no, though, God gave man the gift of work. Did you know gift? Did you know work is a gift from God? And and God told man to manage the garden. And that should put to rest the debate over what's the oldest known profession. It's landscaping. (laughs) God said yes. Some of you will get that later. We said no because we sinned. Well, in our, in our knownness, what did God do? He said yes again. He sent Jesus Christ to die on Calvary for all of our junk, for all of our no's. And now it gives us an opportunity to put our yes on his yes. So when you think about God, he's a yes God. He said yes, we said no. He said yes again on top of our no. And now he says, say yes to my yes. And many of you are just one yes away from making that commitment. You're one yes away from saying, Jesus, take control of my life. I cannot force you to say that. You have to say that. It's your choice. It's your prerogative. It's your option. It's your move. Have you said yes to Jesus? He gives us the ability to say yes. He can't force us to say it, but we're built for yes. And the moment we say yes to Jesus, here's a slam dunk deal. I mean, this is a win-win situation. The moment we say yes to Christ, 
What happens? Well, the first thing he does is he comes into our lives and he places the person of the Holy Spirit in the depths of our being. The Holy Spirit is totally committed to taking self-centered sinners like you and me. He's totally committed to this yes thing. He gives us the ability to say yes to what God says yes to. That's big. He gives us the ability to say yes to what God says yes to. So there's no way I can ever understand what God says yes to until I know Jesus Christ personally. We've got to say yes. Yes to God. Yes to God's principles. Yes to his priorities. And speaking of priorities, you might want to turn to Matthew again. It's uh, chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. That's the priorities, right? And his righteousness, that's purity. And all these things shall be added to you. That's the promise. So we've got the priority. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's saying yes to Jesus Christ. Yes to a deep and dynamic relationship with him. Then the purity part, this is unbelievable here, the purity part, once I receive Jesus Christ, check this out, I receive the righteousness of Jesus. So when Jesus comes into my life, not only does he come there, but his righteousness dominates my life. So, so, so when God sees me or sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Without Jesus, after my best sermon or best book or best wedding or best funeral or best whatever, I fall miserably short of the righteousness of Christ. There is no way I will ever, 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 ever be 100% righteous away from Jesus, and you won't either. That's why you can't work your way to heaven. I don't care if you keep your nose clean and pay your taxes and, and, and throw some money into the offering plate when it's passed, or you work for the United Way or Habitat for Humanity. Good for you. Great. Those are wonderful things. But you will never achieve a righteous life. We can only receive the righteousness of Jesus. We've said no, God has said yes. And Jesus is totally righteous. And once we receive him, we receive the righteousness of Christ. So we've got the priority, we've got the purity and the promises. All these things, Matthew 6, 33 tells me, will be added to me. All these things. Now so often, I think too many Teachers and pastors concentrate on just the blessings of God, just the benefits of God, just the upside of following God. And yeah, we've got to talk about those things. And believe me, there are benefits, there are blessings. However, we need to fall in love with God. We need to say yes to Jesus because Jesus is God, because He's sovereign, because He's holy, because He's the ruler and I'm not. Now, once I say that, yes, things will be added to me and things will be added to you. And God will meet our needs, not our greeds, but our needs. That happens when you say yes and I say yes to Jesus. Lisa and I got married 24 years ago. June 26, it'll be 24 years. When I said yes to her at the altar, I didn't realize the implications of that decision. I'm realizing the implications more and more each and every day, and so is she. What if I would have bolted the moment I said, I do? What if I had said, okay, I do. Yes, I'll love you. Yes, in sickness and in health. Yes, in poverty and in wealth. Yes, as long as we both shall live. Yes, G- yes, Lisa. Yes, before Jesus I say these things. What if I have said that, and then what if I would have turned and cruised and just moved away? What if I'd had very little contact with her for 24 years? We would have a horrendous marriage. I would have missed out on this amazing 24-year journey that God has taken us on. When we say yes to Jesus, we're hooking up with Him. We're committing to Him. We're saying I do to Him. We've got to spend time with Him. We've got to say yes, the big yes to receive Christ, but then those little yeses to walk with him, to, 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 to talk with him, to hear his voice, to know his word, to follow his purposes and his principle 
and to walk with his people down this incredible journey he has for us. And I've got to ask you, are you spending that time with Jesus? I'm not talking about some legalistic thing. I've got to have my daily quiet time, 22.3 minutes a day, and I've got to get up at 4.30 a.m. every day. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about spending time with him because when I miss two, three, four days of spending quality time with Jesus, I cannot believe the free fall that I take. I cannot believe the depravity that emerges in my life. Say yes to Jesus. We're built for yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We sing it. Yes, yes, Lord. Every day. That's what he wants from you. And that's what he wants from me. For us to say yes. That's what's so cool. You know, when we lift our hands in worship, it's like a big why, isn't it? Yes. Yes, Lord, have your way with me. Yes, Lord, where do you want me to go? Yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? Say yes to Jesus. Also say yes to his church. And many of you today have said yes to to church attendance. Thanks for being here at Fellowship. I really appreciate that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that We've got to come together regularly, corporately for worship. Something supernatural takes place when when people open up the Word of God and teach from it. It's amazing. I I can't explain it, but, but God just does it. If we're not a part of weekly worship, we're disobeying God. Are you a part of a local church? Have you said yes to church membership? Obviously, I'm biased toward Fellowship Church. I would love all of you to join Fellowship Church, but... I know that's not going to happen. Maybe it's another church. There's some great churches in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We're in the belt buckle of the Bible belt, man. This is it. But, but, But don't just test the waters and kick tires your entire life. Land the plane. Don't just circle. Land the plane. Join the church. Because there's many things that you can't do unless you're a part of a local church. If you take the word church and read the New Testament and and just lift it out of the New Testament, over 90% of the time, the word church refers to a specific local church. The church is the heartbeat of Jesus. It's the bride of Christ. You don't say, I do, and then bolt. You're with the bride. You love the bride. You're about the bride. Church attendance, that's important. Don't let the golf course or a game or a tournament or a trip or whatever consistently keep you from the church. Now and then it's cool to miss. We don't check everybody off every week on a little poster. Oh, you missed church last week. Shame on you. Our membership office is going to call you up and reprimand you. We don't do that. But but so often I've talked to people after services and they'll go, Ed, I almost slept in today. I almost didn't show up today. Someone invited me to play golf or to go to the lake. But I said no to them and yes to church. And I am glad I did because I needed that word. I needed it. Something supernatural takes place when we're a part of the local church. It's it's, it's those little yeses that lead to great successes. On either side of our front door, we have lamps. And when we got these lamps, they were clean and shiny, beautiful lamps. We've been neglecting the lamps and Last week I walked outside, I was just enjoying the beautiful weather. I turned around and looked at our front door, (laughs) and inside the lamps, I'm talking about it was bug deep, deep with bug carcasses. These bugs had died, and they'd crossed Jordan. I thought, I wonder how many bugs are in these lamps. It was an interesting thing, something that the Discovery Channel should do a documentary on. I wonder how many bugs, who knows, billions, I don't know. So I thought, man, I, I'm going to clean these bugs out of the lamps. So I opened up the lamps, got a vacuum cleaner. This was fun. <laughs> I just sucked all of those bugs out of the lamp 
into the vacuum cleaner. That was, that was a fun thing. I felt power when I did that. And then when they were clean, I, I looked at them, admiring my work, and I said, just think, I was talking to myself, Ed, the lamps became jammed with bugs, not overnight, but one bug at a time. One little bug flying in, another little bug, and then bug after bug after bug after bug, and then they began to make everything dirty, and you couldn't really see the lamps very well, and how do you screw up your life? One bug at a time. One wrong yes at a time. It's not just one big honking yes, yes, and I'll fall down the stairs of life. Whoa, I just said one yes, that was it. No, no, no. A bunch of little yeses lead to giant messes. That's why we need to debug our lives and say those little yeses, the right yeses that lead to great successes, and that is spending time with Jesus, and that is spending time in His church. And it, it, it's frustrating for the leadership of Fellowship Church to try to build a church around people who sign up but don't show up. Do you realize that 30% of the volunteers who sign up don't even show up? I'll be there, man. I'll help with the nursery. I'll be there. I'll help with the kids' church. I'll be there. I'll help with kids' camp. I'll be there in the parking lot. I'll be there as a greeter. I'll be there as an usher. I'll be there with our security. But 30% of the people don't show up. Yes doesn't mean yes. It means maybe. Yes. But if something better comes along, yes, if someone better looking comes along, yes, if I feel like it, yes, if the Mavs are on, yes, if I have an opportunity to travel, yes doesn't mean yes anymore. But those of us who are believers, what did Jesus say? Matthew 5, 37, let your yes be yes, a term of decisiveness, a term of commitment. But hey! I've said yes to Jesus, and I'm thinking about saying yes to him, but I have doubts and questions. Awesome. I have doubts and questions. God is bigger than your doubts and mine. God is bigger than your questions and mine. Doubts and questions mean that I have faith, and they mean that you have faith too. Say yes to Jesus. Establish that relationship with him. You're made for it. You're one of a kind. Love is church. What's going to happen when the roof caves in in your life? We, we live on a fallen planet. Bad things happen to good people. I mean, let's just talk for a second. What are you planning on counting on? Who's going to take you through those tough times when you get the phone call? When you have the setback? When you end up in the deep weeds? Your select soccer team? Your tennis group at the country club? Your neighborhood association? I mean, those, those people mean well, good people. But Christ followers, those of us in the church, we can encourage one another and support one another and help one another and do life in community with one another. We've got to be a part of the bride of Jesus. So say yes to Jesus. Yes to the church. Also, I would say that we need to say a big yes to the most influential people in our lives. How many people are married? Woo! Marriage is not the greatest thing. It's the hardest thing. But if we do the hardest stuff, it can be the greatest thing. My marriage is an illustration of Christ's relationship to the church. Husbands, let's talk for a second. You're the spiritual leader. I'm the spiritual leader of the home. Women are dying for you and me to lead. We've got to step up and be the leaders. 
The word husband comes from two Anglo-Saxon words, house band. We, we, we keep the home together, literally. That's why we've got to say yes to Jesus, yes to his church, and yes to our spouse. Have you said yes, husband, to your wife? Yes to romance? Yes to meaningful conversation? Yes to non-sexual touching? Yes to doing those special things for her? Yes to a date night? I'm gonna talk about a date night until everyone here who is married goes on a date night. So just hold on to your theater seats. Hebrews 10, 25, I cited that verse earlier. Christ followers are to connect in this special experience once a week called corporate worship. Husbands, worship with your wives on a date night at least once a week. Worship through romance. Worship through sex. Worship through communication at least once a week. Don't get to the habit of throwing a newspaper in her lap and saying, what movie do you want to see? <laughs> and some of the young couples here, you got all these little kids running around. It, it's more difficult for you just to get ready for a date night you're like, man, forget the date night. It's too much work. The work is worth it. Guys, we've got to step up and lead in this domain. What you use to get her is what you use to keep her. We don't retire our jersey in the family room and say, yeah, that was my romance jersey right there. I got her. Man, I had it going on back then. But now, no, no, no. I'm just going to Sit back in the lazy boy and watch ESPN 24-7. We get married. Women are waiting for the romance. The wives are waiting. Wow, it's going to be off the chain. Man, we've retired our jersey. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. I'm talking to myself. Date your spouse. If you don't date your spouse, guys, you, you, you're going to date somebody else. I'll say it again. If you don't date your spouse, you're going to date someone else. And let me put it in, in a good way. You're going to commit adultery with someone because of this sex drive and, 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 and this thing about being a man. And, and, and you're going to date someone else and spend all this money when you get divorced from your wife and you'll give it all to the attorneys. You'll be messed up. Your spouse will be messed up. Your kids will be messed up. Boom, boom, boom. Another one bites the dust. That's what's going to happen. And don't even sit there with your self-righteous self and say, well, man, Ed, you're being pretty hard on those of us who are divorced. I, I can't believe it. I thought you taught grace. I'm all about grace. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. No. But there will be consequences to sin. Right now, I could jump in my car and rob a convenience store. I know how to do it. <laughs> I get caught. They would arrest me. Bad boy, bad boy. I go to prison, be behind bars. I could hit my knees. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I want to turn from my sin. Would God forgive me? No doubt about it. Would I still be in jail? Yes. <laughs> you get the picture. God's not going to remove the consequences of that decision. So don't have an affair. I'll take that back. Have an affair with your spouse, man. That's what you should do. Take all that energy, all that creativity, all that money, put it into her. Have an affair with your spouse. Have a date night at least once a week. And a pediatrician was the first person who told me to lead out in this issue. Not a preacher, not a marriage counselor, not some theologian, our pediatrician. The twins were six weeks old and she said, 
hey, Ed, uh, have you taken Lisa out on a date? I said, a what? <laughs> and about 11 years ago, we started this date night thing. This revolutionized our marriage. You're not going to talk about it until all of us do it. It'll change your life. Because if you don't date your spouse, you're going to date someone else. Take a trip together. Couples at least once a year. <laughs> don't go with your family. That's not a vacation. <laughs> don't visit your in-laws. That'll totally mess you up. <laughs> That's an obligation vacation. You need a vacation after that. That's horrendous. <laughs> I talked to a couple the other day. Yeah, we're going on vacation. I said, really, where are you going? Well, we were going to see her parents in Lubbock. I'm like, Well, I can't afford it, brother. My man, you can't afford not to. Put it on the credit card. You are investing some serious capital in your relationship because so goes the marriage, so goes the family. So goes the family, so goes the parenting. So goes the parenting, so goes your community, so goes your community, so goes your city, so goes your city, so goes the state, so goes the state, so goes the country, so goes the country, so goes the world. We can literally change the world. It's all about the marriage. And men, we have got to keep the marriage at the forefront of the family dynamic. I wrote a book about it called Kid CEO. Don't spend any money buying it. Let me give you the cliff notes of it. Well, second thought, why don't you buy it? But <laughs> men, we, we get married, we say yes to our spouse, and then we chase the career because we're rewarded at the office, the corner office, the parties, the perks. We're not rewarded at home by being a godly husband and a godly father. Where are the parties? Where are the perks? Where are the bonuses? But this is where it's at. I'll talk about work in a second, but this is where we got to invest and we've got to step up. What am I saying, guys? I'm saying get your ass in gear. Love your wife as, the Bible says, Christ loved the church. You thought I said something else. Where is your mind? <laughs> as Christ. As Christ. Let me talk to the wives here. Women, let me, let me tell you something about us guys. We are so weak, it's pitiful. So insecure. All these guys walking around like they're so hard and big and bad. Oh, man. They're so sensitive. Always worried about what other people think. Your husband wants you to affirm him, <laughs> to, to put him up, ladies, on a pedestal and say, you're the man. <laughs> You're amazing. You're awesome. We need that. Women are much stronger than men. That's not even close. Have you said yes to that? I'm sometimes around couples and I see these women, especially just like over dinner, torch their husbands publicly just Throw him in the grease. Especially in front of Lisa and I. Yeah, Lisa, you tell him. I'm like, oh, dude, man. <laughs> Ladies, don't do that. I know you want him to change. He ain't going to change that way, not by torching him. Don't torch him publicly and don't torch him privately. I mean, yeah, you can you know, speak the truth to him, but remember, we're delicate. <laughs> we need that affirmation. <laughs> Ladies, too, I know you're tempted, very, very tempted to orbit your life around 
the lives of your kids. Because see, maybe he's chased the career thing, he's way over there, and maybe you're doing the other thing, so you put your kids on the pedestal, and once they feel the warmth of the spotlight, they're not gonna give that up without a fight, so you orbit everything around them, and, and, and you, you see what happens. If you wanna be a great parent, have a great marriage. If you wanna have great discipline, Love your spouse. Have you ever been to a fashion show? I have. Fashion shows are hilarious because people wear all these weird clothes that no one would ever wear. <laughs> and I love the way people walk. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh, boy. And all these designers and all these important people are like watching their every move and shoes and outfits and dresses and suits and, and they're picking apart everything. Hey parents, you're on the runway 24-7 <laughs> and your kids are watching you. Lisa and I have four sets of eyes watching our every move how we love each other, how we talk to one another, how we romance one another, how we forgive one another, how we defer to one another, how we do special things for one another. The marriage has gotta be the most important thing. Kids leave, spouses stay. Let's talk about sex. It's an important part of marriage. It's not the most important thing. I've read some books where it says, the number one desire in a man's life is sexual fulfillment. I don't believe that. I think it's emotional connectivity. And guys connect emotionally through sex. I don't think it's sex, number one. Ladies, let's talk about sex. Husbands, look at your wives for a second. Wives, look at your husbands. You're looking at your only sexual option. Your only sexual option. You are looking at your only sexual option. And the Bible tells me a lot about sex. And if you've got a problem with me talking about sex, you've got a problem with God. The problem's not with me, it's with God. He's the one that made it up. He's the one that invented it. <laughs> and we should talk about it in our homes. But the second most important place we should talk about it is in the local church. And, and, and one of the reasons so many people are so whack regarding sex is because the church has been strangely silent talking about what God was not silent to talk about and create. And at Fellowship Church, we're going to change that. Scripture says the only way a husband and wife should say no to one another is if they both agree to fast and pray. I'll say that again. Scripture says, it got real quiet, very, very quiet. Scripture says the only reason that a man or woman should say no to one another regarding sex should be if they both agree to fast and pray. <laughs> now sometimes you're gonna say no, but say no with an appointment. No tomorrow. It's the, it's the, it's the 24 hour rule. And read about a man's sexual drive, ladies. I believe husbands need that intimacy at least every three days. Now, I'm not trying to do how many times a week you actually do it, but I am saying and quoting various doctors and scholars and theologians about it. Because if that's not happening at least every three or four days, then so often, sexual stimuli becomes overpowering to the man. And I'm not giving the men excuse to jump into porn or to lust or to whatever. But I am saying, if, if both of you are healthy, stop depriving one another. I might buy this tape myself. <laughs> this is good. We're talking about every subject known to man here, aren't we? We might be here until one o'clock. Go ahead and settle in. I'm just getting going. 
Husbands, say yes to your wives. Wives, say yes to your husbands. Say yes. When I'm saying yes to Lisa's needs and she's saying yes to my needs, we're hitting on all cylinders. That's what it is. But see, I, I, I begin to say yes to my needs, and that's where I mess up because I'm the leader. God has given me, the husband, the responsibility, the authority in the relationship. I'm not talking about superiority. Authority. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as to the Lord. Get your as in gear. Oh, let me talk to singles now. If you're single, lift your hand. Oh, boy, it's going to be fun now. Singles. Say yes, singles, to spouse selection God's way. If you're a believer, only hook up with believers. Only date believers. You can fall in love with the wrong person. Can you imagine being hooked up with an unbeliever in marriage? Just for a second. Okay, let's say you're a believer and you fall in love with this non-believer. You say, I can change this person. They need me. I can tweak them. Yeah, they say they're a Christian and... He only has a little anger problem, only a little drug problem, and I, 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 can, I, I, I can change the person. Okay, let's say you say yes to one another before God and the witnesses. You're a believer, the other person is not. Try raising kids. Try building a house with two sets of plans. Try reconciliation. Try communication. Try sex. you're going to fall down the staircase of life. Your marriage will never hit on all cylinders. It's not going to happen. Don't you see the genius of God? God said only hook up with believers. God was not talking about spiritual apartheid. He was not being capricious or cruel. He was not being discriminatory. He was being loving. So a lot of you men and women, single men and women, you got to say yes to doing it God's way. Yes, I'm going to wait for sex until marriage. Yes, I'm only going to date believers who have a dynamic and deep relationship with Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. I talked to a lot of singles who are believers. 30-something, 40-something, and 50-something singles. Singles, let me, let, me, let me give you a word, man. A lot of you think too much. I'm talking to Christian singles. You overthink. That's why I'm for, for, for getting married when you're young and stupid. Get married when you're just dumb as a stump. All this e-harmony on steroids, 565 principles. What in the heck is that about? If Lisa and I had gone through that, we'd have never married one another. I've got dysfunction in my life, she has in her life. Overthinking? Too many people are afraid to commit. You're afraid of the yes. <gasps> but if I say yes, girl, if I say yes, boy, I mean, what if somebody better looking comes along and has more money? Just say yes. All these 30-something and 40-something singles praying for Mr. Wright. Or Miss Wright, Lord, bring him into my life, Lord. Lord, bring her into my life. Well, they're, they're in front of you. Don't pray about it anymore. Just get married. Yeah, but a couple of aspects in our personality profile don't coalesce. And Dr. Neil Clark Warren and Dr. Phil had a show about it the other day. And Oprah said, I, Oprah? Here's a good one. God just gave this to me. This is great. <laughs> Too many singles say, I don't, to the yes, and it's keeping you from saying, I do, to the ultimate yes. Oh, that's good right there. <laughs> Let's say yes to the most important people in our lives. Yes. <laughs> 
all, the, all the single guys too, all, I've, I've, all these single guys have these unrealistic expectations of women. You're these single guys, man, you're walking around with your bald-headed self, big old spare tire, big old butt, and you're looking for Angelina Jolie with the character of Mother Teresa. Hey, brother, look at the mirror, man. Look at yourself. I don't care who you are. Stuff wrinkles and sags. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. Well, there's cosmetic surgery, Pastor. Well, great. There's some great cosmetic surgeons here in Dallas, and they can prop you up and help you and liposuck and know all this stuff, but it's going to sag and wrinkle and crinkle. I don't care. It's not going to happen your whole life. Speaking of cosmetic surgery, it's hilarious. Now and then I'll get this question. Uh, Ed, uh, 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 you're a pastor and, and, and you've gone to seminary. Uh, what do you think about cosmetic surgery? That has got to be one of the dumbest questions. I'm, I'm going to write a book one day, Dumb Questions Asked to Pastors. I go, what do I think about cosmetic surgery? I say, first of all, if you want to roll the dice and put yourself under general anesthesia, go for it. I said, furthermore, did you comb your hair today? Yes. That's a cosmetic procedure. Did you have braces? That's a cosmetic procedure. I'm looking at a lady. You have makeup? Cosmetic procedure. Go for it. Now, if you obsess over it, that's crazy. We're talking about every subject today. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. That's what God wants. We serve a God of the yes. A God of the yes. Have I, have I talked about the marketplace yet? Have I? No? I got to talk about that real quick. That, that's another thing I have down here. We've got to say yes to our mission in life. This will be short. I'll give you the cliff notes. Yes to our mission in life. What has God called you to do? You might perform surgery, cosmetic surgery, good for you. You might preach sermons, good for you. You might score touchdowns for, for Jerry Jones Cowboys, good for you. You might coach kids, good for you. You might teach students, good for you. You might sell real estate, good for you. Whatever you do, Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Yes, Lord, I want to lead out in my business with integrity. Yes, Lord, I want to lead out with character. Yes, Lord, when I say yes, I mean yes. Yes, Lord, I want to be honest. Yes, Lord, I want to go the second mile. And when we do that, when we realize we're working for God, what's going to happen? It will snap the heads of others who are watching us on the runway of life. But be careful now. Don't allow your profession to become an obsession. Don't redline with your profession. I went through a period of time where I was redlining in my profession. I was putting like 40 hours a week in message preparation. That's, that's redlining, man. I remember one day the twins were small. We had three kids in diapers and Lee Beth was five. And I hit my knees in our living room and I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to give you 20 hours of sermon preparation because I have to lead the church and do many other things other than just speak. And I said, after 20 hours, I'm going to shut the Bible and notes and books and walk away from it. And I can't tell you how God has multiplied my time. When we say yes to Jesus every day, yes to his church, our time will be multiplied. We say yes to the most important things in life, our relationships, our time will be multiplied. It's amazing what will get accomplished. We say yes to marketplace endeavors. When we cheat, we don't cheat on the side of our profession, we cheat toward the significant relationships, first being Jesus, secondly being our spouse, and then our kids. Have I said everything there is to say about yes? Whew. No, I haven't. 
And that's what I'm going to talk about next week. No. The power of saying no. We should say no because of a bigger yes, and we'll talk about that next time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this message. And thank you for the joy of serving you. I thank you for being a yes God. Thank you for putting your yes on our no. And right now, I pray, Lord, that that many people would say yes to you. Many are just one yes away from knowing you personally. And I know the believers here are praying for people to say yes. Just say yes. Repent of your sins. What does it mean to repent? It means to say yes. You're agreeing with your condition before God. When you say, yes, God, I'm a sinner, God's not going to say, wow, I didn't know that. Thanks for that information. Thanks for the 411 on your condition. God's not going to say that. He knows. We're sinners. Just say, yes, Lord. I turn for my sin. You've said yes, I've said no because of my sin, but you've said yes because of Jesus. And Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again. And right now, I receive you. Yes, Lord. Just say it. Yes, Lord. If you've never said it before, yes, Lord. I say I do to you. If you said that with me, that's the best yes you'll ever say. And after I conclude this prayer, just take out your worship guide right quick and fill out that form that says, I committed my life to Christ. You jot down your name real quick and your email or address and drop that in the offering because we want to get back to you some vital information regarding this topic. Maybe you're saying, well, man, Ed, I want to talk to someone today about this yes. After this service is over, just make a beeline to the atrium. We have pastors there and counselors who will be happy to talk with you. There's some men here who need to say yes to their wives. There's some wives here who need to say yes to their husbands. Yes in leadership. Yes in romance. Yes in intimacy. Yes in affirmation. There's some single adults. You're, 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 you're choking on the yes. You've decaffeinated it. Spayed it, neutered it, hollowed it out, and it's time to let your yes be yes. Some to date God's way. Others to throw aside these unrealistic realistic expectations and say yes to the right people in the right way at the right time. Others here need to say yes to, to the mission in life, to our vocation, for that critical balance between our vocation, and our home life. Lord, thank you for giving us the ability to say yes. Go with us this week and prepare us for next week as we talk about the power of no. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.